pleasure and honor to share with us uh, uh, the story of automobile. I don't want to bother you, but you know, explaining and discussing the flying car is not an easy task because people are still thinking that it's just some animation, not the real stuff. So really shortly, I will share the story, and then I will be ready to answer all your tough questions and uh, survive your grilling. So really, in a very few slides, this is what we are deeply believing in automobile, and uh, this unites a very diverse team in a uh, very unusual place for such an innovation, like Slovakia, I will mention a bit later. But uh, as uh, Marianne mentioned, my story is a bit unusual, so I would like to explain that uh, uh, I started by education, I'm an artist. I was a theater director for a few years. I was uh, successfully doing this business. Then the second part of my life uh, started as uh, a movement which uh, ended up uh, communist regime in former Czechoslovakia. I was one of the student leaders those times, and uh, I'm really proud because uh, a lot of my very strong uh, relations with the people uh, still uh, very valid for me started those years. Uh, then somehow I move into the new life. I started a few companies as an entrepreneur. I will not uh, uh, go into the details. Uh, Marianne already mentioned uh, some of my companies. I'm still angel investor in different companies here in Europe, in the US, but uh, the usual questions I'm getting, okay, so I lost the connection. Sometimes it's much easier to build a flying car than to operate it. <laughs> so uh, if there is something common in between the artist and student leader and entrepreneur, and uh, my opinion that each time there must be something behind and it's vision or some big dream. And not uh, only, but uh, to succeed, you need a very diverse group of people, but you need to unite them uh, with one bold uh, goal, and uh, this is only one way how to succeed. So, but we are here to discuss our mobile story. So as Marian mentioned, at, at the beginning, it was not me. It was my co-founder. Uh, Stefan Klein was dreaming uh, how to, as he is usually saying, marry the car and the plane, uh, which uh, we are not the first ones. Actually, the first uh, trial for the flying car happens in the U.S. in 1917, 1-7, really very few years when first car and first plane was created. So mankind was really trying to merge both uh, technologies into one, but it's not an easy task. So for 20 years, in his private small atelier in garage, he was trying to build the initial one, what we call Armobile 1.0, which was a totally different concept. Then, uh, actually it was 2010, uh, uh, 2009, he built something which was like, let's say, the first uh, uh, proof of, of the concept, uh, and uh, nobody was believing. Uh, really the problem of him was that he met so many people, investors, people from academia, and he was trying to convince them that this could be real, uh, but only as a technology. So then we met because we knew each other from our student times, and uh, he approached me, and on the very first meeting, and that's true, I, uh, I decided, okay, I will go with him into this venture, and we will build something which will be amazing. So 2010, to make a long story short, we founded a company, but uh, first years was really very simple. Uh, I would like to introduce Stefan because he's a really amazing person. Uh, he, all his life he spent in, in academia. He built in Bratislava, which is not so known, but uh, a very respected uh, department uh, of transportation design at Academy of Fine Arts. Probably all of you uh, listen about uh, Bugatti Veyron, for example. The designer behind Bugatti Veyron is one of his students. Uh, today, over 50 people, uh, top designers in all the global automotive companies uh, are his former students. And next to his official job, he was really trying to build a flying car. I already mentioned myself, so I will skip this. And this uh, equitation uh, Stefan did, that why we were able to study this, because by soul, by uh, our background, both of us, we are artists, and each of us, we cover more than just one position. So uh, he was engineer, designer, and testing pilot, 
and I was investor, businessman, and marketer behind the project. And uh, we were discussing it really for three years and uh, how to start, uh, what will be the technology, how we will use it. And uh, through some personal context, we got an invitation in 2013 uh, to Montreal to showcase uh, this vision. Uh, Aerotech is really very respected technology conference in aviation. And then marketer uh, inside me decided, okay, we must change the game because it will be another uh, group of uh, people just showing some sketches uh, and explaining uh, this project. We will never succeed. So then I decided, okay, let's build what we are calling analog project, not just the, some digital sketches. So we built what we are calling pre-prototype 2.5, which was physical representation uh, of, of the project. It actually flies, it drives, uh, and uh, when we started our presentation in Montreal, after a very few seconds, I realized that, okay, it's here, because when I saw the respect in the eyes of all those respected uh, people from aviation, I knew that, okay, we are getting there. So then the decision was very simple, keep the momentum, uh, and how to, how to move on. Of course, immediately we start uh, to getting a lot of invitation, both from aviation and automotive, to showcase our mobile uh, on main uh, automotive uh, shows and aviation shows. But I decided, no, that's not the uh, right decision, because first and foremost uh, is a groundbreaking technology. So we need to showcase it on the right events like Pioneers in Vienna or South by Southwest in Austin. Uh, and the momentum was not only about the media, but to build it in real. So uh, he was flying the first prototype with such uh, <laughs> instrument panel, which was really a very, very simple one. But I'm proud that as a manager that I was able in just 10 months with a group of 12 people, including me, and I'm not an engineer, uh, to build a uh, current prototype uh, in carbon fiber, leather, interior steel, not the final one, but uh, something which impressed a lot of people. So uh, for those, those of you which does not saw it until now, here is the short video which presents uh, 3.0, which is the last prototype which we revealed. it as a regular car. It fits to the standard parking place, so it's less than six meters. And you can fly. You don't even need a regular tarmac. Take off or landing or space, just grass airstrip is enough. Thank you very much. Uh, so, again.
Okay, here we are. So this is the tea which built uh, the product which you saw in real life. Uh, so immediately, globally, all the media, brand ambassadors, uh, social media uh, went crazy. So for us, we're really sitting in Slovakia, uh, seeing how Mark Andreessen is tweeting about us. Uh, uh, even the big companies, uh, proud like Virgin, Lenovo, uh, XPrize, uh, with the old and also the new one. Uh, if you will today log into the BASF global website, uh, they are really uh, doing a lot of uh, positive PR for us, uh, showcasing Armobile as a really big innovation. Uh, just a few examples, uh, but uh, at the moment we are really trying to keep it uh, uh, low because we need to over-deliver, not to over-promise, but uh, we got really a lot of uh, coverage, uh, like uh, one of the game-changers, uh, innovation of the year by popular science, uh, but uh, the real question is that do we need a flying car? And just in really brief uh, uh, showcases that uh, where we can use something like the flying car. First one, it's uh, what we are calling medium distance travel. Because uh, when you are using regular uh, multimodal transportation, you need to change uh, your transportation vehicle. It takes some time. And uh, even the commercial airliner is much faster than we are flying at the moment. Uh, uh, the final time is much longer than really door-to-door -door transportation. The second use case is uh, uh, commuters. This is a huge case, not only in Europe, but mainly Asia, US, and there is a huge, huge potential. Uh, just I would like to point out that uh, in the next 20 years, uh, more than uh, all the cars we just produced in the previous 100 years of uh, automotive industry will be produced. But the biggest use case for us, where we see a huge potential in the future, is all those countries without any infrastructure. Let's imagine China, Russia, Brazil, Kazakhstan, you name them all, and uh, it's really a huge market. There is an estimation that by the end of 2030, more than 8 trillion US dollars needs to be spent it for the missing infrastructure. So, how to sell it to the world? Uh, First product will be really the niche market. Uh, limited series of what we are calling uh, Flying Roadster. Uh, and then we can discuss it uh, later. What does it mean in real? Uh, how we can use it in real life? Uh, as just two examples, how we can use existing infrastructure because there is so many airstrips uh, also here around London or each uh, highway could be easily adopted uh, because the last mile will be done each time as a car or each uh, gas or petrol station could be easily adopted. So there are really the use cases also in infrastructure. We are not the only ones, but I'm really so proud that a lot of experts are uh, avoiding automobile as a most advanced flying car. There are some military projects, uh, uh, and uh, still this, uh, this market is growing. But uh, we had a functional prototype, a lot of media coverage all around the globe, but still something was missing. You know, a bunch of Slovaks doing the flying car, it does not sound very credible. So I was dealing with that, how to, how to build the credibility. So first step was to build the world-class advisory board. And really, there is a strong British link, uh, uh, because through Glenn Mercer, the former global head of automotive uh, at McKinsey, we got an introduction to Anthony Sheriff, uh, who is the man who built from zero to hero McLaren Automotive. Uh, and not so known name, but uh, in the US, very respected inventor, Dean Kamen, is also part of our advisory board. So with the help of uh, these guys, uh, we move really forward, and we lost again the connection. <laughs> uh, the Wi-Fi still is making my life more difficult and a lot of industry experts. So there is a management team. Two members are here with me. My CTO, Doug McAndrew, a British citizen, working for years on really senior positions with Megler and BMW, Jaguar, Land Rover, and Martin Brunsko, the former head of Europe at World Economic Forum. So you can talk to them after my presentation. Here is the core engineering team at the moment. Uh, we are close to 40 people, so still very lean company. Uh, a lot of people coming from different countries uh, at the moment. We are uh, six nations, 
uh, in automobile, again, mostly from UK, so looks that it's really strong link between Slovakia and United Kingdom. Uh, okay. I hope that the connection will work. Our lives are depending on Wi-Fi so much that without them we are lost. But I think that uh, the important stuff was done, so maybe I will switch it into the slide when we can, okay. we can discuss. Uh, while Yurai is going to switch to presentation, I just want to show of hands. Uh, we've heard that uh, the first flying car was built in 1917 a long time ago, almost 100 years ago. Uh, it took a long time to come up to this stage. How many of you really believe uh, Ironville is going to make it into a production and uh, be a success? Give me a show of hands. Okay. How many of you don't believe it's going to be a, uh, as big as you represented it? Are we have some skeptics in the room, so we have roughly 40 minutes to convince those guys. Uh, let, let's sit down, let's chat. Uh, uh. I hope that after this discussion there will be more hands raised in a second question. Uh, while we're doing this, uh, you guys also have voice. Please uh, take up your mobile phones and open your browser. Do me a favor. Can you all now take out your mobile phones and open the browser? And all you need to do is just type in uh, slido.com. That's it. No downloads, nothing else. And just use the hashtag Startup Grind. And any questions you have, feel free to ask. I promise you the top 10 questions will be answered by Uri, personally. So, you're right, uh, it's been a uh, wild ride, of course, and uh, you've built some businesses before. Let's start from the beginning. Tell us something about uh, how you grew up and what did your parents do for a living? Uh, I'm coming from an artistic family. My father was an actor and my mother was a manager of the theater. So, these two uh, skills are somehow combined. I believe uh, in, in myself that uh, Part of my person is still artistic, and uh, part of my person is uh, manager. Sounds like Steve Jobs, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> uh, I know so you've been in this uh, student movement, and uh, soon after you were a director at a theater. Is this true? Yeah, that's true. I, I was, uh, and it was again uh, so uh, unusual because when I was uh, at university uh, in third year, I was asked by my uh, professors. Uh, to be the director of the theater, which was very famous uh, in the 60s, but then the communist regime uh, closed the theater because it was against uh, the government. So uh, after the revolution, one of the first things they did, they start to reopen uh, the theater, but uh, knowing that they are just the artists, uh, they was looking for somebody who will be the new artistic director. So it was totally crazy. I was 25 uh, years old, uh, and I was hired by my professors uh, I was still the university, uni university wow. to be the, the boss. Uh -huh. Oh, interesting. And how did you go from there into the advertising industry? And again, it was crazy years uh, in, in uh, my country that uh, uh, immediately uh, businesses started coming uh, into the country and uh, first ad agencies, uh, global ones, uh, came uh, to, to form Czechoslovakia. Uh, nobody was, of course, trained and and uh, educated for these new jobs. So they was looking uh, uh, for people which will be able to adopt into these new jobs. And uh, they were looking both from uh, management field and from artistic field. So with no experience, I was nominated as a creative director of famous BBDO network. So I was the founding member of the Slovak and then the Czech team with no experience. My first uh, lesson was uh, during the weekend, uh, Ogilvian advertising. And after that, uh, I became a creative director, which is totally crazy. Uh, are you just lucky or are you just so skillful? What's going on? <laughs> I don't know. I was just trying hard and, uh, uh, of course, trying to build it each time, not just on me, but on a team. 
Okay, and so you build the agency and you have many clients and uh, what made you change from something which is successful, up and running, into something new? But, uh, I need to mention that uh, there was uh, the stage then after one year, less than one year with BBDO, I decided, okay, uh, it's nice, but I will do it differently. So I decided to leave and uh, I left BBDO. Uh, I founded my new agency, which started a very small hot shop, creative shop, which grew uh, extremely uh, fast uh, into one of the biggest agencies, which is still uh, running. I have an amazing management there. They're doing well. And I was looking for some new venture, new excitement. So uh, uh, beginning 2009, 2010, I started my new period of life as an angel investor, uh, investing in different projects. And one of them was Armobile. And in very few weeks, I realized that it's not about the money. Of course, it was a big part of uh, my involvement, but also about uh, managing and building uh, the company. Yeah. I have to give you credit for having a big vision, and I don't think I know many people who have uh, a vision as big as this one. Uh, how many of you have heard about the Hyperloop, Elon Musk's idea for fast transport? So some of you might know that the CEO of Hyperloop uh, is today in Slovakia, where you are is from. And uh, so they building this idea of building the first Hyperloop uh, between Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia, and Vienna. And in eight minutes. In eight minutes. Uh, it takes 45 no, right now. Build, with the to car. travel then. Yeah, to travel. <laughs> now, uh, it takes a long time to build a Hyperloop, and it's just a tube between two cities. What Armobile is, uh, they can connect any city, anywhere in the world. They just take off. And this is something which uh, struck me when I first spoke to you, right? I have to admit I was skeptical. I also thought it's just something which is for uh, rich boys from the Middle East. You know, they have a million or two, they can spend it on, on a flying car and, uh, or ten. But uh, after we had you represent at one of uh, the think tanks which uh, we run in Slovakia, I was amazed about the vision because, as you, you can see, Hyperloop has a lot of investments needed. They build a car and they can sell it anywhere and the car is uh, bringing cities which are in, this, in the, for them, sweet spot uh, from traveling you know, by car four or five hours, five, six hours, because when you want to go and fly, you have to go to the airport and you have to go through, through security. You have to wait for the plane to take off. You have to wait for the plane after it lands. And uh, for this sweet spot, it's really uh, a very fast way of transporting it. How do you think uh, the, the public will react after you will launch, uh, positively or not? Of course, uh, each new uh, technology, innovation, uh, disruptive innovation uh, needs some time. Uh, in our case, uh, it's even uh, tougher because uh, it's not uh, uh, software startup, it's hardware startup, which is each time uh, a bit difficult by investment also uh, by regulation. And especially here because uh, uh, I'm usually saying that we are not just merging uh, car and a plane, but 100 years of uh, bureaucracy in the air and 100 years of uh, bureaucracy on the ground because we need to fulfill legislation both automotive and, and aviation. So it will take some time. Uh, our strategy is really uh, this kind of innovation. It's even military or some niche market. So we decided that uh, the initial product will be a hypercar uh, with wings. Uh, and, but this for us is just proof of the concept uh, by regulation, by technology, by, uh, by brand. And once we will succeed with this, the next big step is a combination of things which are already happening. Uh, we are presenting that it will be not just the self-driving car, but the self-flying car. And the technology is already there. And, uh, How ready are you with that? Uh, 80%, 5%? Uh, definitely not so far with the initial product. Uh, uh, what's great that uh, uh, we can outsource a lot of things. Of course, we are not able to build uh, everything internally, but it's great that now we have an access to the teams, uh, both on the universities and uh, best global companies, which we are establishing the partnerships. And uh, for example, they are in testing, not just the usual autopilot, but uh, what's called AI, uh, artificial intelligence for the flying, adaptive flight control, and this kind of system. Of course, regulation will be crucial, so until then, we will be the regular plane with autopilot with uh, 
the 3.0, uh, the prototype we just saw in the video, there is already an autopilot, so... Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk there. about the first 100 years. Why do you think all these companies have tried and failed? Why is that? Uh, it's, it's a combination of uh, more, uh, more reasons than just one. Of course, the stage of technology. 20 years ago, the autopilot was a big box, uh, extremely heavy, so uh, to install such a thing into uh, Roadster was simply impossible. For example, access to the material, materials like uh, carbon fiber was really regulated. Uh, now the small team as we are, we have an access to the technologies which are uh, the same quality and uh, same uh, advanced uh, uh, sources as big companies are having. So, okay. partly so because of that. The second part is of course the technology. Uh, we have a significant IP behind the company, uh, the way how we are uh, transforming car to the plane. There is a, a patent for variable angle vertex, so we are able to move the wings uh, uh, in a way which uh, the normal planes are not, uh, not ready uh, to move. Uh, so, uh, of course, there is something unique uh, in technology. So when you start and when you help this, this friend of yours uh, to take his idea, his dream to build this, pl this plane, how do you start? Because it, it sounds uh, overwhelming. What do you do at the beginning? No, as I said, we were just sitting and, and talking. Uh, and uh, I was trying to, to understand uh, how this could really work in real life because my co-founder is an amazing inventor, but uh, he is everything but not an entrepreneur. So he was definitely not interesting if uh, this uh, somebody will buy and how it will be used. He was just so focused on, on building and, and uh, combining these technologies. So uh, we, are, we are really trying to uh, to set up the, the first stage of, uh, of the project and to uh, be able to, uh, to create uh, an, an environment which uh, will allow us uh, to, to start to sell this uh, to the people. And this was my job really to create the use cases and to build a team and uh, to, to convince everybody that this will be something like the cell phones, which uh, uh, for me is a nice example because uh, 15 years ago, we had a technology. There was uh, phones mounted to the wall with the wire. Uh, we were able to uh, call each other, but not in a way as we are doing at the moment. There was a lot of studies which predicted that uh, it will be never exponential as it is uh, at the yeah. moment, and it will be still linear. And uh, here I believe that uh, versatility is a new quality, like with the cell phones. Uh, there was again predictions that they will be never used so often uh, for mailing and browsing as it's these days or for video watching because the plasma screen is much better than a small screen in your pocket but because it's so versatile people are using it much more than anybody can imagine 15 years ago. That's true. I, I had a quick meeting yesterday with my ex-boss uh, who used to be running marketing for Orange for Europe uh, at a time where the iPhone came on board and today he's uh, the managing director of BCG, uh, Boston Consulting Group Digital Ventures. And we talked about how the iPhone just changed the industry because we used to have a lot of talks about how Orange and the op mobile operators can become a digital provider. But uh, they didn't because the iPhone changed everything and they just became a pipe. Uh, and people just buy it for data and, and calls. And uh, it is quite possible that uh, this market just needs somebody who is strong and uh, has a vision and just delivers on the, on the promises. And you told me several times that you try to under-promise and over-deliver. What do you mean by that? Because, of course, it's so fancy story, so we were approached by Hollywood, uh, uh, different people, but uh, for us it's not just the marketing uh, stand or uh, Hollywood prop. It's a serious technology which will change the world and uh, the personal transportation. And personal transportation must be disrupted because with current technologies we are able uh, to move everything super fast and super efficient, but just the data. 20 years ago to move one petabyte of data from Palo Alto to San Francisco, it was maybe faster to uh, pick up uh, uh, some car and uh, send old Bernoulli disks uh, in real uh, uh, data format. Uh, and, uh, but to deliver one person from Palo Alto to San Francisco, uh, these days is maybe longer than 20 years ago. So really we need innovations like Hyperloop, like the flying cars. And our story is that uh, for uh, this, uh, it's a very simple uh, term. We need to move transportation from two-dimensional space into three-dimensional because uh, there is something which is 
an amazing infrastructure called the air, and we can use it immediately. And traffic jams are bad, so we don't like them. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, at the beginning, you, you funded the whole enterprise yourself. Uh, yeah, until April last year. Uh, for five years, it was fully funded by me, so you can see that I was really deeply believing uh, in automobile. Uh, but of course, uh, my funds. Were you are, nervous doing that? <laughs> my, my sources are a bit limited, so, uh, and it will be not the best way to be fully financed uh, just by me. Uh, so, from April, when we got the first VC into the project, and uh, even it was not planned, then I realized that this kind of project must be the combination of private and public. And uh, fortunately, the government in Slovakia realized the potential of, of automobile. So we got also the state grant uh, in July last year. So at the moment, it's a combination of public and private funding. So it's not anymore just me. Okay. Uh, what is your future of the funding of this project? Uh, what is your plan? Uh, to find the right money. Uh, to move project forward in the right direction. So we still, in this stage, uh, we are uh, raising uh, uh, around uh, approximately 5 million uh, euros, which will allow us uh, to move uh, into the phase when we will have the final PP, pre-production prototype, and the final information about the final configuration, bill of materials, and so on. And uh, then we will raise uh, the Series B, uh, which will uh, give us the runway until the production. Okay, so you're talking about raising a uh, small round now than Series B. Uh, any plans on, of IPOing around the time of the launch or not? Uh, no, 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 this is not our preferred option. Of course, uh, it sounds again very fancy uh, to IPO the flying car, but uh, we want to, to build it. And uh, what I want to explain that uh, this uh, luxury product is just the start. Where we see the huge potential, it's, uh, let's call it flying Uber. Uh, combination of uh, this technology and a sharing economy. So then you don't need to own it, you will just have an access uh, to the flying car. From your company perspective, do you plan to own a pool of flying cars and rent it out, or you just want to give it to Uber and all the no, Lyft and people no, like that? We are, we are looking for uh, the right uh, clients, which uh, in initial phase will be just the private individuals, but uh, it could be also uh, enterprise uh, sometime in the future. Do you plan to own a pool of flying cars to rent out to companies like Uber? No, we want to sell them. Okay. So you want to sell it. Uh, interesting. Now, uh, when you see uh, the, the, uh, what, what's happening with Tesla, and Tesla has this uh, simple plan of three steps. Building something very expensive, uh, very high-end, uh, to learn how to do that then do the next stage to have an improved prototype and a better car uh, for a mid-tier price and then something cheaper. Do you have a similar plan? You know, there are some similarities. Of course, our initial product is very similar to the strategy, niche market, uh, premium price, uh, and then for scaling. But it, it will be not only uh, building more for less, but it will be also uh, adopting new markets like, like the sharing economy. And this comparison also works uh, in different way that uh, the initial product with Tesla was not the original one. And uh, when I read the book about Elon, he, he told it was that, Lotus, right? yeah, that, that it was Lotus Elise, that uh, if, he can, uh, if he will be able to do something uh, again, he will build it from scratch as an original product, which we are doing. Uh, it's something absolutely unique, uh, which uh, is using nothing uh, uh, from some other product, but uh, uh, it was built as an original idea. What have you learned from the uh, Tesla story uh, with the level with the version three cars? Uh, you guys might know that uh, they have uh, bookings of over four hundred thousand cars, worth I think fourteen billion, right, uh, in a booking yeah, value. Yeah. It, to me, it sounds incredible. Uh, do you plan to do the same? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> I hope uh, really uh, epic success, uh, but. Uh, uh, it's a bit different because uh, it's the usual question when we will start to take pre-orders and there are some clients which are ready to, uh, to prepay this kind of product, but here we are, we are trying to be absolutely serious until we will have the final configuration, which means from uh, what kind of engine we will use because we are testing the different powertrain option, uh, what will be uh, 
what kind of autopilot and so on. So until the final config configuration will be set up, we are not starting the pre-sale phase. But once this will be ready, of course, uh, the usual case will start. So we will start uh, to take deposits and pre-orders okay. to build this initial product. How much say do you have in uh, deciding on the final configuration and the powertrain and the, the chassis? Uh, because you know the technical person you said, yeah. right? Uh, do you let the guy just fly or do you have some say in that? No, of course, uh, I'm usually sta starting my management meetings that uh, uh, my first sentence is, as all of you uh, know, I'm the most incompetent person in a, in a room, but I'm listening really to uh, the senior managers which I have, and their uh, skills, their experience uh, are really crucial for uh, succeeding. So I have uh, Doug here somewhere. Please, Doug, stand up. So Hello, Doug. There's my CTO, yeah. uh, and he is responsible then for what kind of power train will be used and what yeah. kind of components. So and Doug is coming from McLaren, so he knows his stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, knows the stuff. You probably the only person I know who employs a an ex junior minister. <laughs> How do you get these guys to join the company? You need. To do you pay them so much, or you just no, promise? You need to have a lunch with him. Uh, when uh, he invited me for the lunch and he tried to convince me uh, to be uh, the part of his startup which he was uh, building at that time and uh, this was uh, uh, the story uh, when we were eating starter but uh, at the desert uh, uh, he was uh, decided that uh, he will join my team. Oh wow, yeah. so he pitched you but at the end he, <laughs> he, he employed him. <laughs> it's a good story. Uh, so what is your strategy when, when hiring people? Uh, do you always, how do you find them, uh, first of all, and uh, how do you convince them to join? Uh, the hiring was different a uh, few months ago because this was through the personal contact. So Anthony Sheriff, uh, the mentioned uh, former uh, chief of McLaren, uh, once I was able to convince him with the team, uh, he was really doing amazing uh, uh, introduction to the right people. So this was the initial phase. Now it's a combination, of course, of the personal uh, uh, contacts uh, of the people which are already in the company. But at the same time, we are using the world-class uh, uh, recruitment company specialized for this uh, world-class engineering. Okay. So you started with uh, personal introductions first? Yeah. Uh, okay. How many of you are growing fast and hiring new people, new employees? Anybody in the audience is, is, is looking for other team members to join? Okay, there's a few hands. Uh, okay, uh, so when, when you want to find the world-class person, what, what are the key things they want to know? Is it the vision you have, or is it the competence they see in you, or is it the salary? Uh, no, it's definitely not about the salary. Uh, it's uh, that uh, they must be excited, uh, they must believe into the vision, they must be really convinced that uh, uh, what we are doing is, is serious stuff uh, and that we had uh, the real prototype, it helps a lot because uh, we are not selling just some crazy idea, but uh, uh, I saw it each time that uh, when we invited some of these world class engineers for the first visit, uh, they came and uh, first uh, minutes and hours was really very careful from their side, but once they saw the prototype, and they start to uh, dig in deep uh, uh, into the product. They were so amazed, uh, and uh, they were also able to imagine how this could be upgraded. So once this will be uh, really in industry level uh, built uh, again, so we need to rebuild the product uh, once more. Uh, so this convinced them, and for a lot of people, this is the new challenge. Of course, with the uh, track record, which uh, most of them already have, it's just another uh, uh, part of their life when they can be part of something really uh, unusual and, 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 and big. Yeah, and of course they're gonna get their own private uh, flying car when they when you launch. <laughs> or not? It's not part of the contract. Okay, uh, let's look at some questions in the audience. Uh, Somebody is asking uh, Ashley uh, Grealish, "Do I need a pilot license? Uh, will autopilot AI play a part?" Second part. Will the autopilot uh, or AI, artificial intelligence, yeah. play a part in uh, flying the plane? No, we, uh, with the first product, definitely we need both licenses. But it's like with the car, you are not allowed just to buy dealer's room a car and uh, legally start to drive it uh, on the street without a driving license. So we need both driving and uh, private pilot license. But not, it's not uh, such a big obstacle because for the initial level of PPL, private pilot license, 
uh, in the US it's just 25 hours of training, in the EU it's 40 hours of training. So I think uh, uh, having this opportunity, uh, it's uh, enough motivation for doing that. Yeah. How and is, in, the, yeah. in the future, of course, but for that uh, uh, also new legislation framework is necessary. And how do you handle that? Uh, how do you know what are the requirements? Because there must be many you need to fulfill. How do you stay on top of what the EU or the world needs? And how do you decide this with the final specification of the car? No, I think that what was smart at the beginning that uh, we uh, put in place uh, legislation as a really crucial topic. It's not about just technology and design and marketing and, and vision, but of course legislation. Uh, because uh, uh, we don't want to be uh, in a situation when we will have the final product, but we will be not able to certify it. So I was really trying to, to keep it uh, uh, with the first product that we will be able to fulfill the current legislation. And it's happening, we already did some uh, feasibility studies, both as aviation and, and uh, automotive, uh, uh, with a really world-class companies which are doing that. So. Uh, uh, we knew that we will be able to build the initial product un under the current legislation. But what's really great that the big uh, move is happening, uh, but not because of us, but because of drones and unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, this uh, certification and legislation, especially for aviation, is changing. Yeah. We know that Elon Musk had a big issue with this uh, at the beginning. He didn't take care of the legislation too much. Yep. Then he had issues. Uh, what was your biggest obstacle uh, in terms of legislation and regulation? Uh, of course, uh, this, this combination, because in, in uh, some, some fields, they are uh, absolutely in opposite uh, requirements which you need to fulfill as a car and as a plane. So find a way under the current legislation how to combine them and not to limit the final product. I really love uh, the sentence which Doug uh, men, uh, mentioned once at our management meeting that uh, we need to build it in a way that it will be better car because it's also uh, the plane and it, it will be better uh, plane because it's also the car. So not to have it as a limit but to have it as a challenge and to find a way how to incorporate something from one field into the different field. Okay, uh, you mentioning drones. Uh, we have questions here from Anonymous. Uh, with all the worrying about uh, drones, uh, and how will hundreds of flying cars in the air be managed? Uh, again, uh, IT is coming to the place, and uh, it will be not, uh, uh, in the initial phase, it will be not so many flying cars, but uh, once this will start to be massive and, and uh, more and more will be in the air, uh, it's important that already now there is uh, really thousands of units uh, each hour above us, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's controlled and with a new system which uh, now uh, it's, it's uh, prepared and will be adopted uh, like TICAS and anti-collision system and CESAR. So there is a new system already uh, prepared which will help us to organize uh, our space and, and all those units uh, in the Who area. will be managing it? Uh, in Europe it's uh, uh, Eurocontrol which is a regulator which is taking care of this. Okay, and it's also autonomous, so you, you have uh, anti-collision systems built in? Yeah, th these technologies are here, of course. Uh, they must be regulated, so with the old systems you have some distances which you must respect. Uh, with the new system it will be different. Uh, but again, it's happening now and we are ready for this. We are not the limit uh, with the first product, so we can start with the initial product until, the, let's say, old legislation. Okay. It's already so when you take off the, the car and when you take off and, and fly and you will break some rules, how will the police chase you and give you the fine? <laughs> no, uh, I believe that uh, there are some countries which are having uh, supercars as a police car, so maybe they will buy some. Uh, but uh, of course there is a regulation, of course, so pilots are uh, controlled and uh, uh, any uh, uh, conflicts with the legislation will be then covered. Okay. We have one question here uh, which is dangerous. How do you tackle if uh, Aeromobile is used as a terrorist device? Excuse me? Uh, wh what happens if Aeromobile is used as a terrorist device? Uh, uh, good question. Uh, I, hate it. I know you get this all the time. Yeah, but uh, uh, 
if you would like uh, to attack uh, something, it's much cheaper, easier, and it happens uh, to take a uh, pickup uh, uh, with uh, explosive materials and to park it somewhere. Uh, you can you can rent the car and and hit uh, uh, or rent the plane. So uh, it's it's nothing which uh, will change uh, what's what's already uh -huh. accessible in the market. Okay. Uh, so far, looking back for the five years, uh, what was your biggest challenge in a company? Uh, to be able to uh, scale uh, in a way that uh, uh, still the technology will uh, be growing and will be able to, to combine what we are calling old world and a new world. Uh, so uh, really not to have it as a uh, super uh, toy for super rich, uh, but uh, really to scale it, uh, as I said, in a way that uh, a lot of people will have an access to the technology, uh, through the sharing economy and uh, uh, this kind of, uh, of thing. So uh, this is crucial and still uh, be able to, uh, to build it as a, as a global company because we are not the only ones, of course, more and more competitors are coming to the market. So still be unique, uh, be advanced and uh, succeed. Let's talk about competition because there is a bunch of players on the market like Terafugia and, and some other guys and many investors when I speak to them or industry uh, players they, they mention these uh, cases uh, when we talk about uh, the flying car. Uh, how, how much have you learned from your competition? Well, first of all it's really great that we are not the only ones and we are trying to have the best possible relations and really I have a big respect to all those teams which are trying to build uh, the flying cars with maybe different design, different, uh, different technology. Uh, it's good because uh, we have the common goal. Uh, we, can, uh, we have a lot of uh, common interest with regulation and certification, which is really helping. And we are in uh, contact with uh, the other teams in the US, in Europe. Uh, and of course, some learnings could be taken from, from them uh, that, uh, for example, uh, not start to take deposits uh, uh, sooner than you have the final configuration because then your clients will be uh, not very happy uh, waiting for years for something which is not... Of course, this happened to Tesla as well, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we know that you still want to launch next year, right? I, uh, we, we, uh, we promised this uh, publicly, yeah. so uh, we said that we will start to commercialize our automobile next year, uh -huh. which means that we will start to take uh, deposits and, and uh, pre-orders. So when do you finalize the spec? As a, when do you finalize the specification? Uh, yeah, the plan is that uh, uh, this year is, uh, is dedicated for the final configuration and then the first delivery 2018, which okay. is extremely ambitious. Uh -huh. uh, big companies, uh, uh, they need really years and years, uh, uh, just maybe some uh, upgrade of existing model. Yeah. But, you know, still we are in a startup world and we must be a lean uh, company and uh, we are working really uh, precisely on the timing, on gateways and uh, lose that still. It's extremely ambitious, but it's doable uh, and okay. it's enough for us. I want to ask the question to the audience about the price before I ask you. Uh, <laughs> how many of you think, uh, so how, how much was the first Tesla? Uh, the, the, the roaster was uh, uh, 150. Uh, uh, so $150,000 for, for the Roadster, which is not a flying car. How many of you think the flying car will be more expensive than $200,000? Uh, let's talk about dollars, right? Uh, raise your hand. How many of you think it's going to be more than a half a million? Okay, still a few. How many of you would pay more than a million for a flying car? One, there you go. Two. <laughs> Interesting. The young man. Young man, yeah. Uh, so, how expensive is it going to be? Again, I would love to answer, but uh, as I explained, uh, until the final configuration, it's not clear, uh, which will influence the final price. Uh, so, uh, definitely, it will be more than 200,000 uh, uh, euros. So, uh, it's a combination Talking of... about the, version, uh, the first version first which version, comes out. Yeah, yeah. First version, yeah. so and you have a plan of bringing it down for the second version and the third version? Sure. Uh, more we will produce, so then economy of scale will, will work. But the initial product will be uh, uh, in a price, uh, there will be a, a combination of both functionality, car, plane, and uniqueness. Interesting. And uh, in terms of the engine, you're still uh, finalizing it? 
uh, the engine size and uh, the engine in the car. It's not finally yet. No, no. We are testing uh, more than one option. Uh -huh. We are looking for the best from both worlds again, from aviation, from automotive, and really trying to have a solution which will uh, be best for this unique product. Yeah. I still keep thinking about Tesla when I, when I look at this product and uh, what Elon Musk often says is, uh, he often says to people, what is the range of the car? What is approximately the range of the flying car? No, uh, what, we are, what we are planning for the initial product that the range will be uh, 1,000 kilometers. 1,000 kilometers? Yeah, but uh, it's a uh, uh, much longer distance uh, you are able to achieve because it's uh, straight, it's uh, A to B. So it's not like uh, yeah. on a curved road, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, fast and straight. And how many changes do you need to the infrastructure uh, to be able to fly a car? Do you need some added lines to the highway or what do you need? Now again, for the initial product, uh, there is already uh, an amazing infrastructure. If you will take a look, uh, even here in the UK, in the US, uh, even in my country, that uh, there is so many small uh, uh, sporting uh, airstrips. Uh, in the US, a lot of uh, golf clubs, they have their private airstrip. Uh, so you can utilize and you can use the existing infrastructure. Uh, and as, as, a, as a car, roads are already existing. But in the future, as I showed on those visualizations, uh, each petrol station could be easily adopted uh, into the point when you can land and take off, or next to the highways, maybe each 50 miles, there will be an additional uh, grass strip uh, which will allow you to take off and to land and okay. to combine both ways. Uh, so you just use this existing infrastructure and you can just use a plane uh, and a car and fly it. You don't need any additions or any regulation in terms of marking of the, pla of the place or can you just take off from the highway or you can't? No, you can't. There are some exceptions like for example in Alaska, yeah. the regulation in Alaska you can take off from, from the highway. Oh, interesting. Uh, but it's uh, just one country. Uh, but. Uh, of course, you need to fulfill the requirements, so you need uh, to have a contact with, uh, with the tower. So you, uh, but uh, the systems which are there, for example, in an issue product, there is Garmin, which uh, uh, is doing this, uh, this job. So, of course, uh -huh. you can do it uh, without uh, the communication. So you're plugging into the efforts of others. Uh, let's talk about PR for a while, because I don't know how you do that. Uh, it's a mystery to me. Uh, it's a cool car, but there are many cool cars uh, who are flying. How to heck did you get into all these media outlets? What is your secret? <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of time my clients in my agency ask me that, you're right, why are you not uh, doing uh, such a great work for us uh, that for really for zero you have the global coverage? And I told them it was uh, not easy to find the right verse for that, but you, you know, you need an absolute. Come on, don't tell product. us your PR budget is zero. Uh, yeah. So, Seriously? Yeah. Wow. Okay, so how do you start? How do you start convincing uh, CNN or BBC or uh, uh, all these Forbes uh, magazines to write about you? What's what's the secret? I think that the, the uh, most important decision was that uh, we presented it as a technology, not as something which is uh, just uh, uh, future expensive product, uh, but we're really showing that uh, we we are. Uh, focusing uh, with automobile on, on technology side of, of this innovation. And of course, the combination of the regular media, uh, social media, uh, that we were able to attract some really opinion leaders, uh, which uh, give us the credibility in the media. And uh, of course, the product itself, it's uh, so sleek and interesting. And uh, the crucial was also that uh, we were not just describing something which in future people will be able to see, but we demonstrated it also with the first 2.5 and 3.0 uh, and these videos makes really uh, their job itself. This is true. But was it hard to convince the first uh, journalist to write about you? Uh, not really. We, we are uh, uh, being approached uh, on a daily basis with a lot of media asking uh, the questions. But as I said, we need to over-deliver, not over-promise. We could be each week on some global conference uh, presenting automobile. We are uh, receiving an invitation from all the major auto shows just to showcase automobile there, but uh, this is not the right story because we need to build it as a serious company. True, you, you do, and uh, you did a good job, good job doing that. Now, uh, uh, 
you, you mentioning IP on several uh, several spots. Uh, I know that you are using a company, uh, a, a legal company, who is world class. Here in London. Here in London. Uh, how did you choose a company, and uh, why did you decide to to use a world class company for the IP protection? Yeah, very very important question for me. I have to say that uh, at the beginning of this project, when I started really to build it in real, uh, a lot of my very uh, close friends was not knowing what, what I'm doing because I realized that uh, what we have in our hands is something absolutely unique and I need to cover IP. So as I was working all my life with copyrights, with uh, uh, intellectual property, uh, I was talking to my lawyers uh, locally in Slovakia, but they were so clever, they told me that, look, this is something bigger than we are, so we need to talk to some global companies. So in nine, uh, 2013, I ran a global pitch, when in the final, I have uh, two uh, in between, really the global, maybe five most respected companies uh, for IP, and then we choose the one which we are using uh, still, and uh, it's very important because uh, we are uh, competing with uh, other teams and uh, technology uh, behind this is unique and we need to uh, protect this it's IP. It's true, you do. And uh, do you have any, any breaches in the IP or so far it's, it's working fine? Not yet, but uh, I'm sure it will come. Yes. Uh, let's talk about the roadmap. So we know that we, you, you, wanna, you plan to finalize a spec and launch next year. How many versions do you want to uh, keep bringing up on the market? Uh, no, with initial product, you must be absolutely focused, so it will be just one version, uh, because you need uh, really to set up the production and to have full control. We are really absolutely keen to have it uh, absolutely safe and, and functional and unique, so it will distract the team if it will be immediately from the very first product more than just one option. Of course, there will be some personalization. You will be able to uh, have some specific options, but uh, the basic uh, components and uh, specification will be just one. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to the customer list, uh, the list of potential customers, uh, it seems like you're going to have way more customers on the waiting list than you can deliver. How will you choose these customers? There is no waiting list at the moment, as, as I described. And of course, but we are, uh, it's very important because uh, it's a business, so it must create some profit. Uh, with the initial product, it will be a very diverse group of people. It will be not just one type of, uh, of customers, of course, a lot of people which are passionate pilots and uh, aviators. They are really approaching us, and it could be one group of, uh, of uh, future customers. Then uh, for some of the people, it will be just a showing off because the factor of uh, having the flying car is a really strong showing off uh, element. Uh, uh, I believe, deeply believe, that the tech pioneers, the people which are ruling the tech world, uh, will uh, love our product and will start to uh, take their flying lessons and uh, be our future customers. So it will be a diverse group of uh, customers with the initial product. And uh, so you're going to launch this initial product and you will still you will stay st with, with the flying car or do you want to keep evolving the, the product range? Of, uh, of your portfolio? No, we already have some ideas and some initial uh, projects for the next product, but of course it's in a stealth mode, so what we can discuss is just the initial product, but of course uh, uh, in a company we are also discussing and, and planning what we will be after. Okay, uh, do you think it's, it's, it's uh, pot potentially possible to build a self-flying uh, driving car, driverless car? Uh, I already mentioned that, that uh, uh, all these things are happening uh, just now, and it's really great for us that we can combine uh, in our mobile all those technologies. So uh, what we want, and really it's happening, that we would like to have not only as a flying, uh, as a flying car, but as a showcase for a lot of technologies. So we are trying to incorporate into our mobile all these uh, new inventions and, and uh, uh, new technologies which are happening in outside world and to incorporate them into our mobile. Yeah. Let's take some questions from the audience uh, because we are taking them as we speak and we answered a, a bunch of them already. But some of you who would like to ask something in person, uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll, we'll ask uh, Uri in person. So Claude, take go. Do you have any sharings for other hardware startup founders? So what, what is your, do you have any sharings for other hardware startups? Uh, any lessons to hardware startups? Okay. 
<laughs> tough question. Of course, uh, uh, build uh, the initial product. Uh, my experience is that uh, just describing somebody uh, that uh, how this will work, uh, if, you, if you are able to demonstrate the f in physical presence, uh, uh, the initial product is really game changing. Uh, but uh, don't stick to that in a next step because, for example, what we are doing at the moment, we are building the new prototypes, but just digitally because it's much faster, uh, it's much more efficient, and it's uh, much more uh, respected by the regulators because we can demonstrate that uh, it's uh, fulfilling all the requirements. Uh, so start uh, analogically and then move into the digital world. How do you keep iterating fast? So because it, it's very hard to, it, it's easy to have a cycle of two weeks for uh, uh, software startups, but if you need to print something and build something and wait for parts to be delivered, how do you keep iterating fast? What is your secret? No, that for example, that we are having uh, from each prototype just one piece. Uh, so many times a lot of people were, was asking me why you don't have uh, from 3.0 three pieces because uh, there's a lot of interest, you can demonstrate it, it will just block our capacities, so we are really moving super fast. What I showed on the, those slides that uh, between 2.5 and 3.0, there was just 10 months, yeah. uh, and it's a very unique product. Are you not afraid of, of something going wrong and having an accident and uh, losing the prototype? No, it happens also. We uh, had an accident. Uh, it's part of, uh, of this kind of project, so you need to test it in your yeah. life and uh, uh, then once you find what's the problem, to fix it. Uh, and that's actually a good point because it, it did, did, did happen. How many of you have heard about the accident which the flying car had? Okay, there's a few, few here. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, what happened? No, uh, you, during this uh, uh, period of time when you are building something, you need to test it. And uh, uh, during one testing flight, uh, very uh, Unusual situation happens because we were testing one of the many configurations, and the testing pilot uh, decided to absolutely, uh, first of all, very fast and right that uh, we have incorporated also in a previous one and also in this one uh, ballistic parachute deployment, which is amazing technology. You just push one button, or even automatically, uh, in a case of emergency. Uh, there is a deployed parachute. Nobody needs to jump out from the vehicle, and the whole automobile will safely land uh, on a parachute. There's no so parachute for the fl for the driver for the flyer. Yeah, it's it, for for whole, whole. It's car. for the whole car. Yeah. So it was tested, and uh, uh, for us it was of course uh, some unpredictable situation, yeah. uh, which we need to deal with. But what was amazing that all the global technology media they was really. Uh, uh, feeling this as a confirmation that even in this stage uh, it works. the project is so advanced that uh, it was safe enough. Yeah. Uh, just to give some background for the audience, what happened actually, the, uh, the, the flying car, it used the parachute, it, it, it fell down, it would crash a little bit. Uh, amazingly, there was this celebration uh, in the nearby village and there was a TV crew there and they were the first one on the scene. And this seems like the perfect PR disaster. Right, because yeah. they, they, they shot the car uh, before anybody else, before anybody, before you were there. Yeah. How did you save the situation? It was really funny because uh, when this happens, uh, really nobody knows. First TV, so I saw it on TV. Uh, you saw your own car, which you fi financed with your own budget, on TV <laughs> crashed. And actually, wow. I, I was sitting uh, uh, at a dinner with the first investor, we just one month ago, before this, uh, this accident, no uh, uh, give money uh, 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 to us. So How do you save it? What no, do you do? Immediately I, I uh, took a phone and uh, I called all the uh, top managers, so in like 30 minutes we were sitting in a boardroom and we were dealing with this and uh, first of all, of course, you need uh, to say to everybody the truth and uh, explain uh, what was the case, uh, what happens, and uh, what's the result, and uh, really was able uh, to, to manage it in a way that uh, uh, in really few hours uh, we turn it uh, from the bad story into good story, because we show that, uh, uh, of course, testing is for testing. Uh, uh, crash test was created to destroy the car, to see uh, what will be the result, and if it will be safe enough, so we tested in uh, real life, and. Uh, the proof of uh, the functionality 
in the real world was at the end a positive story. Yeah, I have to I have to admit that uh, your experience in PR and, and managing crises uh, is incredible. We had a similar situation where we had Guy Kawasaki coming to Slovakia, and there was a situation, and uh, you gave us incredible advice, uh, which you've learned from this situation and uh, a few few months earlier. So. Uh, it was amazing and it works, so th thanks for that. Uh, we have a question here on Slido uh, from Anonymous. You only showed men from some of your teams. Are there any women in your team yeah, or in the management or engineering? Yeah, very good point. You can visit our website, uh, armobile.com, so you can see some also female faces. And uh, I'm asking my team permanently, we need more uh, ladies in the engineering team. So if there are some here, please uh, so female engineers, uh, then, then talk to us and Watch uh, out. We, we need really uh, also the female point of view uh, from technical side. Okay, uh, uh, let's take two, three more questions from the audience and then uh, we wrap it up. Okay, uh, please stand up and say your question. Very good question. Are you considering doing your IP open source? <laughs> yeah, so once we will be uh, uh, the same valuation as Tesla, maybe we will also reveal our, our IP <laughs> to the public. But of course, what they re revealed was not uh, all. Of course, okay, it's working again. Uh, with the prototypes, uh, it's a different stages of prototypes. So it's experimental prototype, which uh, recent ones was the experimental prototype. Now we are moving towards uh, PP pre-production prototype, which first it's a digital release and then it's physical release. And once you have uh, approved uh, uh, PP, you can start uh, the production. Okay, uh, now, okay, you are the last one now. Yep, absolutely. It's going, to have, uh, it's going to be available in emerging markets. You want to fly to South Africa from here, right? Sorry? You want to fly to Africa and back on the flying car? <laughs> no, uh -huh. it's in Africa. Yeah. Okay, so it's going to be available there. Oh, definitely. Uh, our plan is uh, uh, to promote Armobile as, as a global project, and these uh, remote areas uh, will be an amazing uh, use cases for us. So Australia, uh, Kazakhstan, Brazil. Uh, all those countries which are dealing with the Lego infrastructure and a limited uh, road infrastructure will be an amazing place for us. Okay, uh, now let's wrap it up. Uh, please give it a warm uh, thank you to Juraj Vatsulik from Arnold. Thank you very much.